you started talking about the creativity that someone in kindergarten has and how that's gone um, later in life. And as the world is flat and nations are competing with each other over talent, if you were granted the right to design primary education in different countries, you were able to advise them, what should we do to keep that creativity? What advice would you give someone in designing uh, primary education in, in any country. So, so this is actually my sister's field of research, so it's a little bit... It's a little bit uh, so she, so she, she, became, she became an expert in education anthropology in double PhD, and then she looked over and she saw me and realized that I had somehow stumbled through and been able to survive without formal education. So she, tried, she st actually started studying how I survived and then came up with this theory but 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 subject but but um, but but I think what's important is um, and the way that she just she has a book called um, hanging out messing around geeking out and her theory is that kids today um, so first of all the most important thing is getting people to want to learn because now there are actually so many ways to learn once you want to learn, but most kids don't learn because they don't want to learn. It's not that they are completely um, unable to. With the internet, you can actually, I learned most of what I learned either through the internet or through people I met on the internet. The only thing I learned in school that was useful was typing. And, um, but the way you do this is you get people motivated who have passion, and then you actually don't need to do a lot of the stuff that you think you need in education. And so, so her hanging out part is what it turns out is like if you're hanging out with some kids and say, what are you doing? Um, and then you say, can I look? And then you say, hey, let me mess around with that. And then suddenly you start geeking out. So it's, the, the hanging out part is how do kids peer to peer get other kids interested in new things? And once they're interested in new things, you start messing around together and then you've got them hooked. And then they go home and they study, they study. And you can see this in video games like StarCraft and things like that. But it turns out it happens in math, it happens in craft, it happens in all these different things. And so she's an anthropologist who's been studying how do you get kids interested in peer, peer learning and peer teaching and things like that. And so to me, I think one of the biggest, I look at my background and I always had adult mentors. I, the, it was, whether it was a, um, the pet store guy or the, the, the Dungeons and Dragons um, dungeon master, but all of my, my mentors were adults. And it, the problem right now with schools is that they have these weird age delineated um, sort of fear of adult sort of locked down kids who don't get to go out much. And so you get this kind of Lord of the Flies thing going on at every, every age where it's about the popularity contest. And, and the kids' focus is really on this really limited space. And so one of the things I think is going to be, how do you safely allow kids to interact with adults? Um, how do you make it cool to geek out? How do you get kids to interact outside of school? And, and then how do you also give, the, I think one of the other big stigmas is video games and all these other things are considered bad because the parents don't understand them. But if you look at StarCraft and the community around StarCraft, it's a very rich version of what chess is, you know, it's about mentoring and teaching and the community and stuff like that. So I, I think really what, you, and, and if you look at Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, you get these kids teaching each other across ages and things like that. Well, it turns out that the communities that these kids have, kids have created to teach each other rules about Pokemon are actually translatable to how kids teach each other about computers and teach each other about coding and teach each other about math. And they realize that they teach each other better than they learn from the teacher. And so if you take the teacher out of the mix and you, you allow kids to peer, peer teach, and then the other part is to stop age delineation, um, age segregation. So, if you, so what I would do for primary schools is I would get rid of the shop class and the art class and all that, make one single creative class where you would spend one third of your time working with kids across ages, just building stuff. And it was just all about building whatever you wanted to do. And, 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 and it's like a little kindergarten class, but you put that sort of in the middle of the day. And then you would say, oh, I'm gonna learn chemistry because I wanna do this thing here, and I'm gonna learn this because I wanna do this. I, I'm a scuba instructor. And one of the things as a scuba instructor, you've, what's wonderful is like, well, you've gotta learn this boy's law because in a week, in, in an hour, we're gonna be using the pool. If you're not good at that, you're gonna sink when we're over there. And like, and the, the, the most anti-school kids, I think by the end of the scuba thing, they know physics, they know chemistry, they know, you know biology, and it's about the application of this stuff that is, and again, your mileage may vary. Some kids will study without having any of that incentive, but my guess is that the majority of kids will learn a lot more if you tell them within an hour, 
you're going to be using this do x. And so that's the practice or the theory, I think, that this kind of lab tinkering space is, a, is an essential part of primary education.